In this video, we'll be talking about non-finite and verbless clauses. Now, if you've studied the pendant and independent clauses before, you might be thinking, well, what are these? Are these new clauses? And the truth is that they're not entirely new. You should think of them more as hidden or implied clauses. Okay, so uh, they're often going to overlap with dependent and independent clauses. Most of the time, they're really a type of dependent clause. Uh, but they're a little bit tricky because there's usually something missing that we would expect in a regular class, uh, clause. If we look at our review sentence, for instance, here we have just our basic kind of sentence with a dependent clause, okay, a dependent clause, and an independent clause. The first one cannot stand by itself. It has this little word when, which ties this clause to the next. And the second one, we could easily have this as a sentence by itself. So that's a quick review of the basics. And you might also recall that each of these clauses tends to have a subject and a verb. Okay, so a subject plus a verb. Now the thing about these types of clauses is that the verb is usually what we call a finite verb. Okay, so a finite verb. And what we mean by the word finite is that it is limited in some way. So if we talk about a finite resource, that's a resource that might run out. Now, a finite verb, okay, so a finite verb is marked for three things in particular, and these are tense, right, present tense, past tense, that kind of thing, number, and here we're talking about singular versus plural, and also person, so first person, second person, third person. If we look at our verbs in, in the example here, uh, you can see that we have the verb saw and we have the verb looked, and we can change these uh, based on tense, number, and person. So for instance, I can say, I see, but I can also say, they saw. And if we look at these two examples, um, it's pretty obvious that we're moving from first to, uh, or from singular to plural, we're moving from first person to third person, and we've moved from the present tense to the past tense. So we've gone through all these factors here to change the verb in order to make the verb agree with its subject. And that's why we call this a finite verb. That's what we expect to see uh, in a regular kind of clause, whether it's dependent or independent. And that's where we're going to upset the apple cart, so to speak, and see something very different in that our first set of clauses is going to be, is going to consist of non-finite clauses, which have non-finite verbs. Well, what are those? Uh, it might be helpful if I start with a, a, a specific example here. And the example would be something like uh, seeing. All right, so seeing. There we go. You might know that this is a present participle. It ends in ing. Okay, so it's a present participle. There we go. Ends in ing. And it's kind of timeless. It's not, it doesn't tell us what tense it is that the seeing action is taking place at any point in time, right? It's unlimited, and so that's why we call it non-finite as opposed to finite. If you've, if you've studied parts, uh, parts of speech, you might recall that we talked about verbals, and non-finite verbs are, are essentially the same as verbals. There are some minor differences, and I don't want to get into that right now, but if you've studied verbals, you'll recognize the same thing here. When we're talking about non-finite uh, verbs, we're really talking about present participles, which we just looked at. We're talking about infinitives, okay? And an infinitive is really to plus the verb, so to see. And we're talking about past, part uh, past participles, so past participles, which in the case of see would be seen, all right? If we have these types of non-finite verbs instead of a regular verb, but we also have the, the rest of the elements of a typical clause, or at least some of them, then we might say, okay, well, this is a non-finite clause. It's missing some of the stuff we would expect to, to see normally, but there's enough here to say, hey, this is, a non, this is still a clause. And there are four non-finite clauses then, uh, starting with the first one. Uh, here we have, yesterday they left for Mars, that's an independent clause. And then this last bit, never to return again, this, as you can see, has the infinitive here, right? To return. Uh, and if, if we reconstruct this in our mind, we could say, they never return again. And then we would have a subject, they, and a verb, return. So 
the, the thing with non-finite clauses is that if you can kind of mentally reconstruct them and say, this kind of looks like a clause, it has the features of a clause, uh, let's just call it a clause, then you're probably dealing with either a non-finite or a verbless clause. There's something missing, something different, but there's enough to tell you this is a clause. Think of this as like, you know how the, if you look at a car and it has four tires, but you come across a, a car with three, you might say, well, that's still a car. It just looks, looks a bit different. So our first example then is the infinitive, a non-finite clause with an infinitive, okay? And our second one is very similar. We have this last little bit here, sit in the corner, which is a non-finite clause. And here we have what we call a bare infinitive. Okay, bare infinitive. And what that means is that the word to is missing. So there's no to here. Okay, we could put to in, in parentheses here. To sit in the corner, uh, we have to kind of imply that. But we have the, the rest of the, the, the uh, clause has the main functions of a clause again. Uh, there's extra information in the corner, which is a prepositional phrase. Uh, we can supply the subject, he's, he in this case, and we can change the, the infinitive to uh, a regular finite verb in our mind. So we could say, he sits in the corner. Now, it's important to recognize that these are clauses because otherwise we have parts of the sentence that just don't fit in anywhere when we're analyzing them. Uh, we just don't quite know what to make of them. It just seems like extra information. And that's why this is, this is so useful to know. Our third example here uh, is a present participle. Okay, so a present participle. There we go. After receiving some Studio Ghibli sheet music in the mail, uh, and then we get our independent clause, he spent the entire afternoon behind the piano. So looking at this opening clause then, you can see that it has a lot of features of the typical uh, clause, right? After, this is the, the word that connects this clause to what comes later. Um, there's an object to receiving. Receiving what? Some Studio Ghibli sheet music. Uh, so the only thing that's really missing is a, is a subject, who is receiving. And what's missing is a finite verb. But there's enough here to say, okay, we've got a present participle, a non-finite verb. Let's just call it a non-finite clause, and it's close enough uh, to a regular clause. And then our final one here, I think you start to see the pattern. Uh, this is the past participle, and it has the past participle registered. It has some other features, right, like this subordinating conjunction again, uh, ties this to what comes later. Uh, it has a little prepositional phrase. Missing a subject, obviously, but again, this, this, this is something that we can imply. So those are the four non-finite clauses. Infinitive, bare infinitive, present participle, and past participle. Our last example will deal with a verbless clause. So far, we've often seen that the subject is missing, but here the verb is missing. And this last part of the sentence, each a little taller than the last, we can see that each can be a subject, okay, subject, and all we have to supply is a verb, so we could say each was, or if we want to uh, kind of integrate into the rest of the sentence, we could say each being, each being a little taller than the last, and there's enough here to make this into a clause. Almost every time that, that we have a verbless clause, it's some version of to be that's missing. And if you simply supply that verb, you can say, hey, it has the function of a clause. So those are verbless clauses, and the same pattern applies. These are hidden or are kind of implied uh, clauses. What I'd like to end with is just a note about some tricky cases, because one of the things that you'll find is that often these clauses that are not complete overlap with phrases. So if you look at these two examples, in the first one, sending you cards in the mail, we can say, okay, this is a non-finite clause. It has a present participle uh, in sending. And there's some other features of a clause as well. There's a you know, prepositional phrase here at the end, uh, sending you cards. Cards is the direct object, okay, direct object. And you is the indirect object, sending cards to you, okay. So lots of features of a clause. If we just change it a bit, we, we have the regular thing. 
But the last one here, all we have is running. We just have a present participle and we can say, okay, well, this function is like a noun. I like what? I like running. Uh, in which case, this is what we call a gerund. Uh, gerund is a, a present participle that acts like a noun. And we might be better just to classify this as a noun phrase then, a noun phrase, rather than say this is the beginning of a clause. There's just not enough here to really say okay, this is like a clause, right? And that's where you see this kind of shading of one thing into another. It's hard to say, is this a clause? Is this a phrase? That there are moments when the two come so close together uh, that we can disagree about that, and that's okay. But the main thing I hope is that you've been able to see how these verbless and um, non-finite clauses act really like hidden and implied regular clauses. If you understand that, that concept, uh, I think you'll be well prepared to spot them in a sentence.